Welcome to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble, powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. Greetings, everyone. This is Teresa Gamble, the host of Courageous Conversations, and we are gearing up for August, which is celebrating and supporting Black business owners. And we have our reoccurring special guest, Ms. Adonica, Adonica L. Toller of Toller Visions, LLC, and the Museum Administrator of the Ritz Theater and Museum in Jacksonville, Florida. So we've been hearing all this culture talk from Adonica, but now we're gonna take a deep dive into actually how she got started in this industry. And then we're gonna discuss her roles and responsibilities as a museum administrator. Thank you for joining us this morning, Adonica. How are you? Hello, Teresa. I'm doing fine. How are you? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I've, you know, wanted to make sure we have the perfect theme for this conversation. Uh, so we're in, we're actually in a virtual museum. Being yeah, I a, see that. How clever. Yes. Um, being a masterpiece on the virtual wall. Absolutely. So let's, <laughs> di- let, let's dive and get right in. So how, yeah. did, you know, I know we um, went to high school together. And you was a history buff and you, you know, a history nerd. So being a history buff and a nerd in high school, what what briefly tell us what was your journey in getting taking a deeper dive into being an African-American historian or a historian in general? Um, well, when I always loved history and I uh, when I decided to further that in college, the main thing that people said is, oh, you're going to be a teacher. And I'll go, no, I didn't want to go into the classroom. And that, you know, when once you announced that you're, going to, you're a history major, that was the avenue that people were pushing you and you're going to in the classroom. And I have to admit nothing, you know, I know teachers are very important. And I also feel that you had to be called to be a teacher. I really think it's a calling. But I was not excited about going into the classroom and teaching. And, but I enjoyed sharing with people about history. And and I noticed that people would be a little interested when I told them facts. Um, the first response was, oh, history is boring. Ooh, you, what you gonna do with that? Are you gonna be a teacher? So it was nothing beyond the opportunity that I would have, then I would be a teacher. Nothing wrong with teachers, you know, teachers who prepared me. But I also knew that that's not where I was supposed to be, but I wasn't quite sure where it would be that I could be. Um, And uh, to give you a backstory to this too, um, um, when I was about 10 years old, I remember sitting in my grandmother's house, watching television, And, you know, that's that generation. If you're watching television, you've done all your chores and your homework is done. And actually, Bill Cosby was on there and he was talking about museums and he was talking about art and black artists. And I and I remember I was kind of playing with one of my dolls or something, wasn't really paying attention. But that gathered my attention that he I said, oh, there's black people that do that. Oh, okay. And so he the way he talked about it. And I said, and I was like, what? Okay, whatever, like that. And fast forward to when I actually was working here at the Ritz as the museum administrator, I was walking, preparing for a museum tour. And I walked through to make sure everything was in place. And as I was passing by, I heard in my head, you're working in the museum. And I went, and I even remember what I had on that day. I went, oh, I am. And I was like, oh. Oh, and then I remembered coming home from elementary school every day for, from first to fifth grade. I passed the Ritz when it was still raggedy and run down. And I always was attracted to the building. If I was talking to friends on the bus, I would stop and watch the bus until I couldn't see it anymore. Now I see, and, and when, when, I got that revelation in the museum and it was like, you set me up. It was like, God, you set me up because I love that building. I did. It was, I don't know why I just, and if I had 
missed it, I'll be upset. Dang, I was in my mouth. I really would be upset about it. So that's why I tell people I feel that I was actually, this was a ministry for me. I was born to do this. I always could remember the history. I always was drawn in it to it. It didn't matter what the subject was. Um, of course, once I really understood the significance of African-American history that wasn't taught in school, I loved it even more and things made more sense for me. And I, I can't explain what that meant, but it made sense to me. And the pieces started falling into place for me in my head. And so um, it, I always loved history. I always sat at my grandmother's and grandfather's feet when they talked about what it was like for them. Um, you had, you know, other, you know, everybody else, they weren't, they want to hear that. But I sat there and sometimes I initiated the conversation. Grandma, tell me about that time you told me. And then, you know, you did that. And could you tell me that again? And then I would, then I would ask more questions. So I was always intrigued and I always loved sitting with them. And I had, you know, I just loved it. And so it was just easy. Um, so it, I just know that I was born to do this. Wow. And uh, let, the, me hop in. let me hop in right here. So you actually telling me you you um, inherited your storytelling from asking questions of your grandparents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And listening to them and telling the stories. Because go, oh, wow. For, what, what was that like? And what? Oh, okay. What? And I remember one time my grandmother, she actually was, um, born on a plantation, but they weren't plant, they weren't slaves, but she was born, she was born in uh, 1916, but it was still a plantation. She said, I was born there. And she's talked about playing there and playing in the fields with the, you know, the crops all high up and she'd be running through. And she said one day she was running through and there was a cougar right there. Like, Whoa. and I was like, Whoa, what'd you do? And she was like, I looked at him and he looked at me and he went that way and I went that way. <laughs> So I just enjoyed that, you know, I just enjoyed their stories. And I even, you know, I enjoyed where she talked about how small she was and people used to pick on her and her, um, her older brother raised her because their mother died and he was raising her and he told her, you need to stand up for yourself, but stand up to your, for yourself. And I remember that story and she said, they used to, um, pick at her, beat her, rip her clothes. And she said one day her brother her brother said, if you come home again with your clothes ripped, it's going to be me and you. And so she was like, okay. And she said the next day they bothered her. She looked, they were messing when she was walking home. They were picking at her and said she saw a board and they had some nails in it. She said, okay, I'm going to get that. She said when they came on and she swung at her. And she wow. took care of it. She said they didn't bother her anymore. And she came home. Her dress was not torn up and she did not get in trouble. And what she said that gave her courage. It was like she appreciated that he did that for her because she was so timid and she was small and people took advantage of that. But she got strength from that for him making her stand up to her for herself. That's what made her strong. My grandmother was a strong woman that you definitely would be inspired from. So it just, um, I, I always loved history. So when I went to college, um, I could, I, I mean, to this day, I, even some of the lectures, I can remember when I learned a fact and what class I was sitting in and who the professor was and what they had on and what I had on. So significant things that, that what? I didn't realize that. I can remember that. And so I, when I started working, well, I actually started um when I went to grad school, my st subject was Eartha White, who was a woman here in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling my professor at the time that I wanted someone that we don't know really about, but really impacted their community. And she said, well, Donica, that's anybody. That could be anybody. And my mother was working at Eartha M. M. White Healthcare at the time. Wow. And the her when I and when she said, Well, who is that? And I, I remember looking off and I saw the name. I said, Eartha White. She said, Okay, I'll get you started. She gave me three pieces of paper with to start researching, and the rest is history. And Eartha White, studying Eartha White here in Jacksonville, 
opened me up like nobody's business. This woman was so dynamic in how she served the community, her activism for women's rights, um, civil rights, being an entrepreneur, being an advocate for the elderly and children and the people that she worked with crossing the color line, um, partnerships, uh, being an advocate for the military. Like, come on, in World War I, you're the only woman, you're the only Black person in a committee for the war effort that men in South, you're the only Black person and you're a woman sitting in a room with all, and I think there had to be about 60 people in that group. You're sitting in that group talking about the war effort and how to make sure soldiers are taken care of. And you're the only black person and you're a woman. And, and there's accolades letters saying how excellent she is, how in, in, insightful she is and innovative she is. And some of the things that they initiated, it, were her, it was her ideas. I'm like, well, what kind of woman is this? And so, so um, just... You- So let me ask you this. So in college, Eartha White was your dissertation or a research project that you did? She was my, she was my, she was my thesis. Okay, good. So from crafting this thesis and taking a deep dive, that, how would that drive you even the more beyond the thesis to stay in that lane? Well, well, okay. So, so as I did that, um, so as I was doing research on her, I in, in I went to the Clara White Mission at the time. It had it was not as active as it had been in the past or as it is now. The um, the CEO now, Jacoby Pittman, had just literally like a, when I met her, she had just started working there. We have a we twenty eight years. And I came in as I'm doing research on Eartha White and I want to come and volunteer at her mission just to, you know, get to know her and et cetera. And so she was like, sure, whatever. So I started plundering and moving around the mission and I was noticing historical documents just laying all kinds of different ways. And, and so I asked permission, may I go fully in and see what's there and put things in order? And she was like, okay, if you, okay. Like, it was like, okay, what if that's what you want to do? And I found that I was finding so many important historical documents. I mean, things from the 1800s, I mean, uh, and things like that. And so I actually called Dr. Eton at the Black Archives at Florida A&M University. And I said, hey, this is what's happening. What do I need to do to properly protect these items? And so he told me what to do. And I went to um, Ms. Pittman and I told her what was happening. And I asked for if she would purchase something so I could start taking care of things. And so she was like, well, okay, sure. And it, that was the Pandora box. I mean, by the time I finished and by the time I came and, and, and I would go back to college, come back, et cetera, et cetera. By the time I finished and I started working, I came back to work at the mission it was one, it was like two rooms. It was just full of artifacts that belong, documents that that tracked Eartha White's life. And it wasn't even fully cataloged properly. It was just me putting them, you know, getting it started so that it could be properly inventoried and cataloged. And so in I'm that- is a- Wait, so you're telling me Adonica L. Tolder that you are responsible for creating the archive history of Eartha M. White in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, for for the documents that were at the Clara White Mission, yes. Wow. And which documents are more, there, there are more, oh, more documents than what the University of North Florida has, much more. And um, in that process, the effort to revitalize the Ritz was happening. And uh, I had already started having a little reputation about my wealth of knowledge. And so I was asked to be a part of the committee, the history committee that would help decide how the museum would tell the stories, like what stories we're going to start off telling because there was so, Jacksonville's African-American history is very 
rich and wealthy and the legacy is has um, international um, impact. Mm-hmm. And so I was part of the committee with my dear friend, Dr. Carolyn Williams, who is now deceased, but she brought me on. And so we were part of that group and I just continued to, you know, get the information um, that, and even Eartha White, Eartha White actually had the first African-American museum here in Jacksonville that was established in the 1930s during the depression. So wait, and I actually, wait, 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 so wait a minute. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I had to jump in right here. So you mean to tell me riding on that school bus past the dilapidated Ritz Theater building, you was not just visually drawn to it. Eartha White was calling you to it because she was yeah. the um, matriarch of founding African-American museums in Jacksonville, Florida. So she was seeking for a response replacement well, had to be. Was must gone. have been must and be. because you were such a passion for the building not knowing the historical precedence that's inside of it that mm-hmm. uh, that historical torch was passed on to you to keep it going. absolutely wow I would say. Oh, wow, wow and wow. the thing about that is i actually found a letter between her one of the few letters she was too busy to be writing, but um, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, one of the founders of the Afro American Life Insurance Company here in Florida, uh-huh. um, was the president of the organization at the time. And apparently, the two he and Eartha White had been talking about there needs to be an African American museum. This letter is written in the early 1930. They're having this conversation. Depression year, 1930, the depression is happening. Right. And they right. apparently they've been having conversation about there needs to be an African American museum here. And that's what the letter that what the letter was about. And then going just in my years, found out that I knew she had started it, but her getting it started. Augusta Savage was key in helping her get it going. Mm. So I have to go on a whole nother journey with you on how that came about. But the impact of Augusta Savage and what Augusta Savage was doing nationally, um, the WPA projects and there were efforts to bring art to poor black kids and Augusta Savage was leading that leading that charge and also and, and establishing museums Augusta Savage was part of that national charge Eartha White was already having that conversation um, I knew they knew each other because Augusta Savage did live here in Jacksonville before she moved to New York um, but when the WPA had an art project Eartha, so the Clara White Mission was the base for the Black activities in the Black community during the Depression, the WPA projects. Right. They had a writing project, sewing project, art project, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, in the art project, there was a gentleman um, sent here to manage those art projects. Eartha White was the board president for the state of WPA projects. Wow! Now, now, what? Now, what? Hey, woman! Now, now, hey, committee lady! Now, see, my mind is going back to my childhood days and making me thinking about when we be when we used to go to vacation Bible school and they had us doing them art classes and had us doing different things and had a display of the art that we created once we was given a theme. So you mean to tell me Eartha White was having this conversation with the president of the Afro-American Insurance Company for the state of Florida 35 years prior to the civil rights movement that we needed a A museum museum for Mm African-Americans based in Jacksonville, Florida. Yes. Wow. And so so now that you have this torch, hold on, because I know you are you a history buff as history buffs don't like to talk about themselves. They like to talk about their work. But today we're talking about you. 
So from doing this thesis, from um, categorizing, cataloging, right, Eartha M. White's um, historical footprint, whether it's verbal or whether it's her works, and it positioned you to be a history expert because of all her contributions in Jacksonville, Florida. From that Mm -hmm. expertise and graduating from college, what what was your what was the mission and the goal after getting this degree for you? Well, what happened, I was still connected to the I I took a brief moment where I took a rest because I had gone straight through. So I my haven was the mission. So I would come, I mean, I would get rested up because I, you know, I was actually rig and burned out. And I would rest, but then when I was refreshed, I would go to the mission because it was like, I just love, you know, what this meant to me and, and what Earth of her life, her legacy, and it really sparked interest in me. Mm-hmm. And in that, you know, people were asking me to come speak or, and things like that. And even Jacoby was like, what well, Donica, were you? I was, okay. So the other part was the mission, what happened when Miss White died, a lot of her things were stolen and what was kept is at the mission building. Mm-hmm. So I was responsible for reviving the museum and the mission. So I actually would do tours for people coming through groups that came through to volunteer to help feed the homeless. Um, I would give them a tour um, and there were school groups coming through and there was even a art program um, that where we taught children about the art history program where we taught kids about architecture and the civic architecture and the historic business businesses and buildings that were still standing and we tied that in the history and they did a little art they did a little art thing at the end and at the end of the year we actually would make these greeting cards or thank you cards with the images that the children made and they would we sell them and we would have an event at the end of the year and all the kids come back and we just had this great party and thank them for participating in the program. So I was doing all of that. And then I was asked to be on the committee to reopen the Ritz. I helped with that. And I was doing other lectures and things, but I was basically based out of the mission. I wasn't hired there yet. I was still volunteering, but I knew that was it. And, and, and I'll tell you, I was going out looking for other jobs, but I wouldn't get hired. And it didn't make sense. I even applied to be a substitute teacher in the school because I was like, well, at least it'd be something, you know, right. but I didn't even get hired for that. And that's why I felt like, okay, I'm not supposed to be in the classroom. Mm-hmm. So as I continued doing this work and it, and the, the Ritz building was rebuilt um, and I was come and it was time to get ready for the opening. So I would come and volunteer that I go to the mission, do my thing over there. Then I come over here and, and volunteer, whatever. And one day, the Carol Alexander, the executive director at the time, I was doing some work. She came in and she saw me doing some work and she stopped by. She said, she said, fill out the application and get back to work. You hired. And that and that's it. I didn't even do a job interview. Wow. That's how I got the job as the museum assistant. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you graduated from college, you couldn't get a job as a substitute teacher, but you had a degree in history. And, but because that was not your call to teach it, but actually be a practitioner of, of it, mm-hmm. you use your volunteerism with Eartha White Mission and at the Ritz Theater that was being um, revitalized to land your dream job from riding on that yellow school bus looking at the building. <laughs> that's what you... That's now, it. If that's not divine, I don't know. Yeah, it's not divine. <laughs> wow. And I didn't... Um, and I didn't... Um, and like I said, there was no interview. But see, she... But by then, people were aware of me and what I, was, what I did and my knowledge. And see, this is the other thing. I wasn't thinking about it I was just being it so because I'll be honest like it wasn't till much later and even now I'm really getting a grasp of how much how many people know who I am because of what I do Mm -hmm. because I've never gone out to say look at me look at me 
I just, oh, let me tell you about this. And so um, I, I'm now really getting how impactful I have been. Um, and then I'm like, okay, I still kind of downplay it, but I'm finding the people that I admire that I don't even didn't realize that they know who I am. They letting me know how I've inspired them. And I said, really? But we don't even talk. He said, but I've been watching you. So it's true. People watch you and see how you, you know, how you operate. They're watching your moves and how you treat people is really important. I, I get that. I'm getting that more and more. People say, I've never heard anybody said you railroad them, you disrespected them some kind of way you took a job from them or any I I mean I have more and more people telling me they really respect that I they know I know what I'm talking about but I'm also a nice person and so they you know I was like wow thank you so it but yeah that's how I got the job <laughs> that's how I got the job and in it I continue to grow because we're telling we we re, the mu, the beauty of the museum is that we tell the story of everyday people. Now that may not sound exciting until you really if you really understand our history if you really understand what it took for a black woman to go work in a white woman's house and take care of that house better than or or and then come home and take care of her house and then you find out the children of the white um, owner white biz, um, boss loves your mother as much as you love them because she really took care of them. You know, I've had those, I've, I have experienced a white family coming in, a mother with her children and there's a black woman with them. When the mother's talking to them, they ain't paying her no mind. I have seen it. And the black woman said, hey, ma'am. And they run up to get up on the meal. <laughs> I've seen it in this modern time. It is still so. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you. Wow. I, I mean, and I've seen them bouncing around like she didn't say, or even in, obey me better than they obeyed their mother. And that you just met me. But I'm like, hey, what's going on? You know, and they be like, oh, and they're just as well behaved as everything. Wow. So, that's good. That is that's part of. I mean, that's part. That's a part that's a, of the story. All right. but, that's amazing. It sounds like you're talking about the. For those of you to put it in perspective, she's really describing the movie called The Help because my mother was a domestic worker, so I understand the dynamics. What you were talking about, how the how the Caucasian children were more responsive and receptive of the African American woman versus their actual mother that birthed them. So I we have so much more to share, but we're going to take a um, commercial break and this conversation will continue because we're going to talk about actually what Adonica did from being promote hire as a museum assistant to becoming an, a museum administrator at the Ritz Theater that she fantasized about. Adonica, I, I I want to continue this conversation. We will continue this conversation, but we wanted to press pause right here. And I want to say thank you so much for sharing your story. And I look forward to learning more how you have evolved in this historical pivotal role that was spiritually mantle passed from Eartha M. White from you as thank a you. girl. So stay tuned, everybody. This is Teresa Gamble, your host of Courageous Conversations with Adonica L. Toller. Her life and journey from being an African-American historian, a museum assistant, and we're going to help, we're going to listen and get part two of her role as an assistant to an administrator. Thank you for listening. Stay connected. You've been listening to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble. Courageous Conversations is powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. Would you like to be a guest and have your stories, lessons, and best practices be captured in our audio encyclopedia? We're currently reviewing applications for future guests to join us, and we're especially interested in creating space for long-standing or multi-generational Black-owned businesses. For more information and to be considered, please email info at crpcnow.com to request an application 
And remember, do not get weary in well-doing. You shall reap if you faint not. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9.